Hi, I'm Charlie Montatuiello with Blue Bear Flutes. Our website you may have been to is bluebearflutes.com. That's bluebearflutes.com. Bluebearflutes.com. I always have people ask me, do you sell these flutes? And yes, of course, we do sell flutes. We actually make quite a few of them and uh, ship them all over the world. I do have uh, a really great presence, I would say, on social media. We have some beautiful flutes that my wife takes pictures of. Uh, a lot of which she makes or helps make or some of which my son makes or what have you on our Instagram page Instagram.com forward slash Blue Bear Flutes and if you don't want to have an Instagram account you can always go to the bottom of BlueBearFlutes.com and look at our Instagram link there we also have a TikTok presence which is growing a little bit as we go so anyway today's video is something I've had requested a great deal it's on how to make a low D drone flute the principles you'll learn from watching this video will help you learn how to make other low tone or really any drones, uh, which honestly I could have said the same thing about hundreds of other videos I've made, most of which were making this kind of flute or that kind of flute. There's a lot of tips and tricks we have going on in our videos, and if you're just now seeing us for the first time, number one, I'd be surprised. Number two, you may have just learned about Native American flutes, or number three, um, I don't know what number three is. So anyway, this video, like I said, is what a lot of people have asked me for, and there's people out there selling like two-page pamphlets on how to make one of these, uh, but I always find that videos help to describe and explain things a little bit better. So what we're gonna do is cut a piece of beautiful red cedar to the size of a blank. We're gonna route it out. I'm gonna show you every step of the way what we need to do and how we're gonna get there, and then we'll go from there. So first thing, I'm using a table saw. Keep in mind, I'm not advising you to use any kind of power tools like I'm using here. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I also have a video on making a wooden flute by hand with a few knives and tools, and you can apply the principles from that to this, or vice versa. And you don't have to use red cedar to make the flute either. You could make it out of a pine two by six, which I, originally I thought about doing this on this video, but I thought to myself, you know, I could really use a Red D low drone myself. So here we are. The first thing I'm going to do is cut a piece of wood uh, in the shape of my pattern here. This is the way I used to always make flutes with a pattern. This pattern is not quite three inches. The new version of it I make today is actually three inches, but you'll notice this one's like uh, two and seven eighths ish. And I've got this set to two and seven eighths. And so we're going to chop this piece of wood first and foremost. just need to cut the piece in half. Now, if you started off with two thinner pieces, there is one thing you want to consider, and that's how big of a hole in the middle of this piece of wood you're going to put. So if you've got two pieces, and each piece is, I'd say, somewhere between 15 and 20 millimeters thick, you're probably okay. And I say between, and that is quite a vast jump. It's almost, uh, it's a little more than an eighth of an inch. Um, if you make the outside too thick, it's going to be a lot more sanding trouble. If you make it too thin, it's not going to be good enough to make a flute with. So, um, this piece of wood I chose because of how thick it was. Like I said, you could have two pieces of wood that were already near the thickness that you want. And once you see what I'm doing, you could decide which thickness would work out best for you. But what I'm going to do right now, taking for granted that the thickness of my piece of wood is around 46 millimeters and half of that would be what about 23 um, That's way thick enough to make this in any kind of range of what I have told you so far So what I'm going to do is cut this dude in half and Put my saw here to about 23 And see what that looks like Always eyeball stuff. I don't always rely on measurements because you got the blade thickness to consider and a few other things. This is probably going to make two halves that are about 21 millimeters thick if I'm guessing. Yep, right up on the money because my blade's about two millimeters wide. You know, all this stuff is really, after you've been doing this a while, it's all really some level of semantics. It's, you know, should you do it like this or should you do it like that? 
And uh, there are other ways to make drones too, like the A-frame drone that so many people are fond of, mostly because you have a lot of Greek DNA in you, I think, because those are Greek. Uh, my little joke there. But anyway, uh, those are the A-frame drones are actually not originally historically. I haven't found a version of them from this country past, say, 50 years ago, um, or maybe 65 years ago, but really 50-ish. And historically, most of our drones were side-by-sides. They were two flutes that were like usually made like this and almost always made out of clay. Um, so that's what we've got going on historically here. So let's go ahead and chop this dude in half. Once again, not telling you you should use power tools because this is incredibly dangerous. I've been using power tools since I was about five, which is about 35 years ago. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's uh, 45 years ago. They say your math is the first thing to go. And before any of you say, oh my God, your fingers were so close to that blade, I'd like to remind you that A, I'm a professional, B, I've done this most of my life, and C, I got a nice table saw that actually the blade will stop if I touch it, so um, I've heard a lot of really good things about this one. I like it, I've been using it for some time, haven't made a lot of videos with it because we've been focusing on other types of videos. But now I have two pieces of wood, about 21 millimeters thick, and there's a little line here, so I'm gonna sand that off and then I'm going to show you my setup on the uh, on the planer here, or excuse me, on the router table here. Um, I'm going to skip showing you the planer. That's kind of boring. One thing I should have mentioned is the length here. And uh, the reason I didn't think about it is because there again, I'm doing things a little differently. The length of this blank is about 25 and three quarters of an inch. That's about one uh, quarter, one and half an inch bigger than what it needs to be. But I wanted to make it that way so the mouthpiece was just a little bit bigger. And so if I could shave a little bit off the bottom, I can do that too. Um, one thing I will tell you is that how you make your drone is really up to you. How you make any of your flutes is really up to you. I've had so many people ask me, what about this backstop here that you've got on your, your rider table? And honestly, I made it this way so that it did a certain thing a certain way. And so it's not really necessary to have your backstop exactly like mine, but the reason I made the video is because I had so many people ask me the question. I wanted to show you why and how I did that. So this is my uh, backstop or my backboard on my router table, and I believe the video has that in the headline, uh, in the title, as well as the words explained. So that's what you've got there. Anyway, so we talked about the width was about one and seven eighths, and then the length on this one is about say 25 mil or 25 inches long you know kind of close anyway it's important too that you know which one is the top and bottom and front and back left and right and all that mess so that you don't accidentally route the wrong side and then put it together and it doesn't match now if you're using two pieces of pine wood or two pieces of western cedar that you got at a store and they were already thin enough and you didn't have to cut it like I just split this in half um, you may not worry about that so much. It would still make a wonderful and a beautiful uh, flute, but uh, I mean, because we've made like millions of them like that. But, but uh, you know, like I say, this is how I'm doing it on this one. And something else too, I've used this Wixie uh, depth gauge here forever and a day, but because of uh, changes in the way that we do things in the shop on the production level, I haven't used this in a while. And because of that, this one's kind of, eh, kind of freaking out on me. So I've got to take it home and fix it. Otherwise, it's been a great depth gauge, and I'll show you the old-fashioned way of checking the depth of your router bit. So, this may not be exactly 100% accurate, but it does pretty good. So, what I'm trying to shoot for here is about 10.85 millimeters 
is how deep I want this to go. Now from the angle you're at, you may not be able to see it, and there's not really a good angle for me to get for you because I have to go all over the place looking at it from different ways to see if this is right. You could also put a flat edge on the top of this. The piece of metal that I'm measuring off of is actually a millimeter thick, so I made my depth a millimeter shallower than what it is using this uh, piece of metal, which it needs to be about 10.85 deep. That's how deep this thing is going to cut into my wood uh, on this first set of passes. There's actually two passes that we're going to deal with first. I have my uh, pattern here. There again, adjustments from the old days because I've made different widths and what have you. And like I say, today I cut it out of a three inch wide instead of a one or two and seven eighths. But the first pass we're going to use a quarter inch, which is the the distance from the center of the router bit to this backboard. That's the quarter inch that you see here, and it's going to be 10.85 deep. Putting this back up on my little stand here, once again, very old school. I'm going to start with the first piece of wood. I'm going to go down on this first black line. I'm going to go to the second black line, lift it up, and then go to the third black line and go all the way the rest of the way out. Then I'm going to go in reverse, and I'm going to route this end of it all the way until it gets to this first black line on my right hand. I'm going to lift it up, and I'm going to go back down on the next black line and stop at that one, and then that's the first set of passes on one side. I should mention to you too, because I've, I've learned over the years, so many people ask me lots of questions, but most of the questions are answered in other videos, and so that's the reason I don't always accentuate all of these questions uh, in answer form for you during the production of the video, but that having been said, this router bit is called a couple of different things. A core box, a flute, a, let's see, not a round over bit, that's something that looks more like this. It's the exact opposite of what we're using. A core box, a flute, a, uh, there's one other name. If anybody can think of the other name for this router bit, please put it in the comments, because I'm, I'm trying to remember and I'm just having a brain fart here. Um, but this router bit has a number of different titles, and you can get them that have a bearing on the top of them, like this round over bit has a bearing on the top of it, but you don't want that. Um, when I couldn't find the ones I wanted in the old days, I would buy these cheap metal ones that worked pretty good. Um, and they had a little nub on the top of them, a little guide pin instead of a round uh, a, uh, bearing. And so I would actually cut that off and sharpen it using it like that. So it was, it was a pretty, pretty interesting experience uh, back in the old days. Um, and I say the old days, that's like 25, 30 years ago that I used to do that. Um, the size of this core box or flute bit is uh, three quarters of an inch wide. That's the diameter that it'll cut. They say it's a three eighths of an inch radius. I don't know why they advertise it based on the radius versus that, except for the fact that people maybe in the molding business, which is usually who buys these, um, only need the radius, they don't need the, the full width, but you'd think they would put a bearing on the top of it if they're making molding out of it, so I don't know. But here we are, and plus we call it a core box, which means it's made for cutting the inside out, uh, not just the radius of the outside. So anyway, uh, this one is, like I say, three quarters of an inch wide or three eighths of an inch radius. And hopefully I'm gonna get at least a three eighths radius out of the top of it here. But some of them, depending on what brand you get, may not work as well. This is a Bosch brand. The one I really prefer is the Diablo or what most of you woodworkers watching my channel call Fru. I speak German and Norwegian, and it's not Fru, it's Freud, <laughs> just like Sigmund, but whatever. Anyway, so we're going to go ahead and route this as I explained. The next pass won't be as descriptive. Oh, safety first.
no, I make this look safe, it most definitely is not. So, there again, not telling you should ever try this here at home. Um, so there's two passes, which is side and side. One thing that a lot of people make a mistake of is they'll accidentally duplicate this down here on one end and vice versa. Or they'll flip it over the other way and accidentally route the bottom of the other side, which of course won't make a drone. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'd suggest re-watching the video because it'll probably answer those questions for you. So the next pass I've got to make is the same depth, but move my backdrop, my backboard here to a half inch instead. So let me do that. Keeping the depth of this the same as it was, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you had a minute to go ahead and check the depth again to make sure it hasn't moved any because sometimes when you set the blade or the bit, it will move and throw you off. I'm just going to look at it and like say eyeball it here. Okay, looks good. Same old, same old. Now it'll be easy to follow which one needs to be up and which one needs to be down. Like I said, that's the reason I do that. got to watch out for you seen it get snatched right there that's where some of the danger comes in anyway now it's basically the hole is the width I want it to be and the width here should be about an inch I'm almost hesitant putting this caliper on it because I know it may not be exactly an inch but this one is it's pretty dang close so when I tell you that you can set up your own guides and use different patterns and make it different widths and still come out with a D drone, the goal is to put a one inch diameter hole in the middle of a piece of wood twice. And I just put uh, two one inch wide tracks or pathways or holes or flutes is really what historically they've been called. I put those into one piece of wood side by side and the next thing I've got to do is go true up their depth. So it's a half inch deep and an inch wide, which is what we're looking at right here. This is a an inch wide from here to here, and it's a little more than a half inch deep. That's what that 1085 is. Um, but next we're gonna go and take it to the next level, um, which is uh, make it about 13 millimeters uh, deep, which is just a pinch more uh, than the 12.5 that it takes to make a 25 millimeter uh, diameter hole, which is about an inch. So, I've done that with two sides. Next, we're just going to make some adjustments here. Go on the, the last two passes. Sixteenths is the first of the next two passes. The next one seven sixteenths. 
So you can do the math and figure out the calculations to make that happen yourself. It's like knowing where 516 is on the tape measure, you know? Just you either know how to use a tape measure or you don't. And I'd love to be the one to teach you how to use a tape measure. Maybe I ought to have a class on that, how to use a tape measure. So many people look at it and say, this is a half inch or this is a quarter of an inch. And like I say, here in the shop, not all of my tools are measured in met metric and standard. A lot of them are. And I use both depending on what size I'm trying to get. I don't like to measure small things in sixteenths and thirty seconds of an inch. I like to measure them in millimeters. And I don't like to measure large things in centimeters. It just doesn't... The numbers aren't in the frame that I want them to be in. I like to keep most of my uh, sizes within a certain ratio, you know? So, anyway. The next thing after that is setting it up a little bit. Let's see if I can do that fairly accurately. I told you it needs to be about 13 millimeters, which is right here. It's not quite it. But, oh, there you are. It's probably almost too much of it. See, 13 up top, and we are looking at. Oh, yeah, and because we're sitting on a millimeter, I need to make it 12 actually, don't I? Let's make it about 12 millimeters. That's not right. It is almost exactly like right on the money. So, we'll pretend. Anyway, last two passes. I hope you're ready. Oh, also, one thing I didn't mention. In making the the uh, size of the inside roughly an inch, um, once again, not using a one inch router bed. That is actually more dangerous than using this three quarters inch router bed. You know, it's just part of the deal. Everybody thinks I want a this size router bed and that size router bed. I have had a lot of woodworkers ask me, where can I get a one and a half inch, you know, core box router bed? You don't need one. The smaller one actually cuts faster, cleaner. I can replace it at my local. Uh, Ace Hardware, Lowe's, Home Depot, True Value, whatever you've got, um, and um, it is uh, a lot cleaner cut. It really is. All you have to do is a little bit of math to figure out how you're going to wobble that three quarters of an inch to make a one inch out of it. It's not really that difficult. Anyway, here we go. be a lot more consistent with everything else that I do. This part of it is what a lot of people would call the tricky part, which is really not. Let's see, 5 16 6 and 7 16 right there. So 7 16 is where I'm setting it. I guess if I were to think any of this would have been tricky, it would have been the part where I actually I'm not making eight passes here, I'm only making four. And really, I'm making eight cuts. So some people might not would make the measurement such that it's equidistant from here to there, and then from here to there, and then from here to there, and then the same from here, and here, and here. I say this is really, it's a very technical thing, and whether I think you're ready to do it or not, I do know, like I said, there are a number of people out there selling little pamphlets on how to make this low D drone, 
for like 30 bucks and I'm thinking how many people are actually going to build one of those with that pamphlet? If you've seen that pamphlet before, please don't post a link to it in my video because that not only distracts from our channel, but it also may mislead someone in a really terrible way because $35 is a heck of an investment, it's a cheap investment to, to make something that, you know, for example, I've been selling for let's see, somewhere around 10, 18 times that much money. And most other drone makers that make low dean drone, D drones, they charge, you know, even more than I do. Um, so there's a lot of work to this is what I'm getting at. I'm just showing you basically how it's done. I'm definitely not recommending, as I said before, that you do this. Um, but if you want to know what the process is without having to invest any money in it, there you go. Uh, I'll tell you that I've had woodworkers that told me that they've made flutes and lost fingers on this thing. I cut mine off before right here on a table saw making flutes as I have always done. You know, and this was some almost 20 years ago. Um, but um, this kind of thing happens. It is a dangerous uh, job doing woodworking by hand. It really is. And like I say, we've changed a lot of our processes and everything in the shop to where our job is a little bit more sustainable for us and that way I don't have to charge you like exorbitant amounts of money to keep up with inflation and the cost of wood and everything. So we try to keep things affordable. And uh, that reminds me too, if you haven't seen my Google Flute video, you ought to check that out. Hopefully I'm still offering them by the time you see this one. But that's on uh, our YouTube channel as well. So let's do this last pass. I'll quit talking and get this over with. Okay, so there we have two nice halves, and we are getting ready to drill it out. We'll put them together so you can see what they look like right there. So I have a little chunk missing, but that's okay. I made it an extra inch and a half or so long, so we're good. Um, this is going to be a really good one. One other word of advice, if you are a skilled woodworker, or if you aspire to be one, or if you think you can handle it, whatever it is that has gotten you this far, um, don't use tools if you're impaired by medication, by drugs, by alcohol. Uh, no matter what you do, I don't care what you do in your free time, I'm going to tell you if you are impaired, there's some things I know about this and I'm going to tell you skilled woodworkers out there that nobody else is going to understand or make any sense of or probably not worry about. And that is, if you noticed, when I first put this piece down, sometimes it grabs look it can really grab and when it does it's going to throw this piece of wood in the wrong direction and it's going to cause you to get hurt it's going to smack you in the face break your thumb break your finger cut your hand off it could do a number of things so i'm saying this because one of the people that come to mind that that uh, had asked about a certain person's pamphlet on how to make this low d drone which is like i said it's about eight or ten pages of pamphlet i'm not sure what the instructions show but this is a lot easier than it than it looks. It's just very dangerous. Um, but uh, but anyway, this one person, their channel is mostly about. They have a, a channel of sorts or a lot of social media, mostly about being drunk and high all the time. And I'm thinking, I sure hope you don't turn that machine on because it scares me to think about what can happen. I mean, I've gotten hurt when I wasn't messed up <laughs> using most of my faculties. There's no telling what can happen otherwise, and I just want everybody to be safe. So. If you want to watch me put some holes in this thing, we'll take that to the next step. Let's see what this looks like. You can even stay right here while I do it. Let me grab my pattern. If you noticed, I looked on the other side of it to see what it looks like because I'm going to want to have a pretty side to be the face of this. This is my D-flute 
pattern. I'll give you some measurements as soon as I get them marked here. It's off the top of my head. I don't recall most of them. Just doing this, like I say, 100% old school. If you don't know it, a machine or a calculating device cannot tell you where to put those fingerings accurately. You might think you can use a app or a website to help you figure that out based on the width and the length and the diameter and all this stuff or what key you think you want to make it in. None of that matters. And if you believe it does, feel free to ask me in the comments and I'll be glad to give at least one person an answer. Um, everybody else, you're going to have to read that comment. But, but anyway, um, so we've got this marked. I'm going to give you some quick measurements and then I'll tell you We'll take it over the drill press. I'm going to say that these are estimates. The first fingering is about six and a half inches from this area up here, which is going to be our sound hole once we get over the drill press. So six and a half inches right there. The next one is about seven and three quarters. So this fingering up here is about seven and three quarters. I'm telling you this because I have a better viewing vantage point than you do. The next fingering, the one of the bottom three grouping here, uh, from my angle, looks like it's about 10 and, let's see here, about 10 and, where am I at there? About 5 eighths, I guess, somewhere between 5 eighths and the 7 sixteenths ish, or, that's not 7 sixteenths. <laughs> anyway, it's about 5 eighths is what we're gonna shoot for. Um, and then after that one, the next fingering, the second from the last hole is 12 inches. And then the last, last fingering is about 13 and 3 eighths. So go back and rewatch that. We'll probably post them in the uh, description just in case you missed them. But like I say, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. A lot of you are saying, well, I want to make a six-hole flute. Please watch my six-hole flute videos before you even think about saying that. Um, and most importantly, a five-hole flute is no less traditional than any six-hole flute. If we're speaking about traditional, historically, Native Americans didn't make low-D drones. Uh, and also, historically, Native Americans didn't make low-tone drones or low-tone flutes. So we can get really in-depth with that if you'd like. But... You don't need that sixth fingering because on a modern six-hole flute, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch my videos on modern versus traditional six-hole flutes. But a modern six-hole flute, you're going to keep it covered most of the time. If you want to produce that note, it's easy enough to cover the fingering right here, or excuse me, the fingering right here, the one up top, and leave that one uncovered, and it makes the same note. I have videos on that. So don't feel like you're missing something because you don't have a half-step note that's not in the minor scale that native people would have never used. Anyway, let's go drill this out. Do it this way if you want to see anything that's going on. Okay, so the next part is something I've been doing for a long time. Some of you might think it's not necessary, and in some ways it can be done a different way, but this is how I prefer to do it. And if it continues to work for me, which it has for about 35 years now, I'm gonna keep doing it. Um, I've got a torch here, and I'm going to torch the inside of this guy just enough that it's mildly darkened, kind of blackened. And the reason I'm gonna do that is numerous. I should have said the reasons that I do that are numerous. Um, number one, it actually helps to seal the wood if you blacken it like that. That's a minor part of the deal. Number two, it actually helps to harden the wood, which for soft wood such as eastern red cedar, that's a really great idea. I typically don't work with hard woods. 
Hardwoods are going to react a little differently on that router table also, by the way. For those of you thinking that you're going to make yours out of some kind of ancient deforested product somewhere that you, you're going to have a purple heart flute block on the top of it and whatever. Those are things that woodworkers in the 1960s and 70s really got into. And it just doesn't sit with me being native myself. So I'm not going to go cut down the rainforest to make something. And then, of course, we have the modern people that are going to say, are you going to cut down a cedar tree? Look, dude, you don't know how the cedar tree fell down. <laughs> and yes, there are ancient woods that are laying around that fell down just the same. I can think of three or four of them, but, you know, you just, you're doing extra work and you're not getting much out of it, is what I'm saying. And what you are getting in some cases is really not worth it. That's why straight up mahogany is illegal. Mahogany from Africa may not be, but stuff from Brazil has been off the market for years. It's a beautiful wood. I've worked with it. My piece of mahogany was ancient and really beautiful stuff but you know I just don't it doesn't sit well with me there's a lot of reasons for that if you can think of some reasons and I hate keeping asking people to put stuff in the comments because I sound like a youtuber then but uh, as my kids say but there are actually some things I want to hear from you and that's one thing I'd love to hear is how do you everybody that's watching this video how do you feel about people using you know exotic hardwoods is it is it really worth as my dad used to say, the wear and tear on a chicken's butt. Yep, that's a country saying. Most of you in the north are scratching your head. Honestly, probably everybody's scratching their head. I don't know how far that one <laughs> got out of the woods. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we are almost to the point that I can glue this dude together. There was a time, too, when I used to uh, put wood glue on the inside of this flute to help make it a little bit more slick. And, of course, I can also sand it with some sandpaper, which really helps. But I'm going to use a sanding rod this time once it's dry. Okay, now it's all burned. I am going to put a drop of super glue. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to put it in this knot here if you want to watch that. This will help seal the knot into place and it'll keep it from falling out. It'll probably put some glue on my beautiful table saw. But we'll take it off of the table saw here in just a second. Okay, so there's a spot. Pull this one up. I'm going to put a couple of spots where the router grabbed it right there. There's another knot. Uh, here's a piece that I probably should fill with something. But I think the glue is probably going to help it out. And then down here at the bottom, there's another spot right here. Glue helps to seal some of that stuff. That part, a lot of it's going to be cut off. And then here's this remaining part of the knot from the other side. Just a little help, you know. Like I say, not really massive there. The next thing is just regular old glue, wood glue. Uh, this is tight bond that I use. I prefer tight bond. I've been using it for many, many years. Um, I'm not getting paid by tight bond. And I'm also not getting paid by any of these companies, to be honest with you. They'd be smart to pay me. I'd make more videos. But uh, in this day and age, you've got to go looking for them instead of like it was back in the old days where they look for you. If you all know somebody that works for tool companies, you'd be welcome to send them my way. I can tell you a few things I'm not changing. My glue, <laughs> not changing my table saw. I do have a little bit of, uh, I guess, admiration for a cheap tool company I'm gonna to mention to you in just a second that is also not paying me. Well, I've actually thought about approaching them, but there again, they could tell me no. What do I care? As long as I'm helping you guys do something, I think I'm happy. If you do know that company, you want me to mention you more often, I would suggest telling them. Because that would give me a lot more opportunity to make videos. 
purpose right now. I'm making a lot of flutes instead of videos. There we go. This glue here is also water soluble, but when it dries, it is also water resistant. It's also fire resistant, this particular version of it. It's good stuff. And it's also safe. You can use it on stuff and touch it like I'm doing here. And then wipe your dirty fingers on your apron. And even though it's not going to wash out of your apron, you're probably going to get in trouble with the missus. Or the mister. I guess who's making flutes and who's doing the laundry. Just trying to even this glue out a little bit. From my top view here, I can see some shallow spots where it's not thick enough. I've got some runs. I'm trying to avoid them if I can. Okay, good enough. So now we're going to flip this dude over, put them together, make sure that the mouthpiece end is on the mouthpiece side, and the bottom of the flute end is on the bottom side. Now I'm going to tell you about these clamps that I buy from Harbor Freight. There's a number of companies that I use to get tools and whatever from, and I found another company at one point in time that sold these clamps for as reasonably priced as Harbor Freight does. I haven't found many companies, however, like Harbor Freight that takes the clamps back if they break, uses them as a method to improve, and eventually sells me clamps that don't break anymore. I've not found another company like that. They have a lot of very inexpensive tools. They do have some moderately priced tools. They used to give away like a free flashlight and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I don't know what to tell you. They're not paying me. They probably should be because I've used a lot of their tools over the years and I really like these clamps. These are definitely my favorite clamps. They work just as good for me. I'm not saying they'll work that way for you, but just as good for me as the expensive ones do. It's pretty well centered. not even a quarter of the price, at least at the time that I made this video. And they're hard to get a hold of because uh, they sell them, but I don't know if it's supply chain issues from events that took place in 2020 and 2021, <coughs> but uh, these clamps aren't always on the shelf where I want them to be. <laughs> this is just incredible. I wasn't even counting them, and look exactly how many clamps I wound up with. Just enough. Hey, kitty kitty. My little kitty friend. There you go. Why don't you take a look at this? This is our shop kitty. Her name is Renault, ain't it? She's kind of hard of hearing. I just wandered up one day. You're a big help in the shop, ain't you? You help us keep our sanity. <laughs> Anyway, so that's it. We'll let this guy dry overnight, and we'll come back and finish up the next step of it. And uh, I'll show you everything along the way so you know what you're looking at and what you're, uh, you know, in for. But I'm going to warn you, like I say, I don't recommend doing this. It is a lot of work. This right here is the reason that a lot of flute makers only make A-frame drones, because it is tons easier and safer to do that than it is the way that I do it. Uh, these type of drones are more historically... Uh, on par with the original designs that Native American people would have used and I uh, hope to post some videos about that here one day soon. I've got some footage, I just haven't haven't uh, made a video out of it yet. And I say I, but actually my wife Jessie's the one that does most of that work <laughs> and a lot of everything else. So uh, come back to me either in a few minutes or on the next chapter and we'll see what happens next. So this is a roundover bit. This particular roundover bit, I believe, is a one inch is what it is. Um, I've used numerous sizes and shapes of roundover bits, and the thing that really matters the most is the how you're using it, really, more than which one you're using. So if you have a larger roundover bit, say inch and a half or inch and three quarters or something, and, and you're using it in one way, you can not set it so far up and not set the back so far back and it will still cut off virtually the same amount that a smaller roundover bit will um, 
and I, I tell you this because we've kind of experimented which, with which one does best in the shop. Um, this one I think is probably the best all around, but when we're making really large flutes, one's bigger than this D, which is quite big in itself, um, we do have a slightly larger one that we use for those. And uh, to be honest with you, like I say, you know, the, the larger ones have their benefits if you're making big flutes, but if you're making a bunch of medium or small size flutes, uh, that one inch probably covers most of them, including drones especially, and especially low D drones on up to the high tone ones that we make. But if you want to watch this real quick. nice smooth rounded edges that's really what counts uh, it makes your sanding job a little bit easier I could have probably adjusted this one a little bit more to make it cut just a bit more off uh, like I said we do have numbers of other sizes of round over bits but they're not really a major concern um, this right here is something we used to do by hand you know just the round over helps get us down the road a little bit um, so to give you a heads up like I say the next things I'm gonna do is put square holes in here, tracks, and I'm going to um, put a little bit of a track underneath, and you can see some of the pictures of what it is going on. Then I'm going to burn these holes out and tune them so that the, firstly, the bottom of the flute will be cut off so that it's in the key of low D, and then I'll come back and tune each of these holes so that it's in that D minor scale. I'll show you where to put the other fingering on the back, but I don't think I'm going to put it on this one because, as I said, I'm going to keep this one for myself. And that low D uh, drone fingering in the back is kind of a stretch for even me to play, uh, which is why I usually offer it and the low E with a plug on the back because I imagine mine being the medium-sized hands, most people with small hands probably won't be playing a low D flute. And... Uh, you know, if, if I can reach it a little bit, then somebody else can probably keep reaching it. Or if you decide you want to leave the plug in all the time, you can leave the plug in. Myself, it's just more comfortable to play without that plug on the back of a low tone drone. So you can look at my other flutes and see what they're about and why it is that I'm talking about that. I do believe I have a video making a, a mid A uh, drone flute out there that you can watch, as well as several others, of course. But like I said, this is making a low D drone. Other than the pictures, you'll probably hear me playing it next.
Okay, so the flute's all finished, and I know there's some parts that you didn't get to see me working on, but those are basic principles that I have had people over the years tell me, you talk too much, you do this, you do that, whatever. Uh, so you can go back and watch me talk too much in other videos to figure out how to do that part and how to tune the flute. And I've even got a, a video specifically on making a low D flute, and you can go and watch that one because it's the same basic principle except for here, there's two low D flutes that are side by side. As I mentioned, I did not put the extra fingering in this one simply because that's how I wanted to do it for myself. It does play two notes on the drone side, which is nice. You don't always get that, but this time it was um, available. And then uh, let's see what else. D, F, G, A, C, D, I think is the, the scale I promised you that I was going to tell you. I mean, it's a minor pentatonic key of D. Um, the five note of the D minor pentatonic scale, I don't know what else to tell you, but it's, you know, available just about everywhere. I do have it on my website on the info page if you have any questions about that. But uh, D, F, G, A, C, D. Uh, it's also part of the A minor pentatonic scale, which is why A and D are fifths. You know, they share some of the same notes. Anyway, lots of stuff we can talk about. I'm going to play the one side of it so you can hear just the flute. So it's a really good sounding flute. You notice I'm a little out of breath there. I've spent so much time making flutes recently that I haven't been really playing them as much as I probably should. Uh, the more I play, of course, the better my breath control is. And as I state on the website, you know, low tone flutes take more air than higher tone flutes. So like an A drone, for example, would take much less air than a low D drone. And a G drone, for example, will take much less air than a low D drone, simply because um, I'm trying to get the best quality tone out of it as a flute maker and that requires a certain amount of space and size and things we've discussed before in other videos to make that happen. But as a flute player, I want it to sound the best that I can actually make it sound myself. So, you know, if you're a kind of person that's always out of breath or what have you, maybe a low tone drone isn't the thing for you. You may aspire to be a great flute player and think, oh, this is uh, something I absolutely have to have for my repertoire is this low tone D drone. And it may really not be what you need. So there's a lot of things about that that we've talked about in other videos and other things we'll be talking about in new videos to come. And don't forget to check out some of our most recent videos. We do have some great ones. And really, at this particular moment in history, if you look before and after, uh, we do have some really great videos coming out really soon. So keep in mind, um, they'll be available here pretty quick. Any which way, I hope this video finds you well, and I hope I have helped to show you how to make a low D drone. Um, I'm not telling you to make one, mind you. The tools are really dangerous and might not be the way to go, but if you watch my how to make a hardwood flute video uh, by hand, maybe you can figure out how to do that without using tools. Big, fancy, expensive, electric, you know, finger goblin monsters. Anyway, I uh, hope this video, as I was saying, finds you well and that you've enjoyed it and certainly at least have an appreciation now for what it takes to make one of these and can uh, look at them and their infinite value that they have. So once again, Charlie Montatuyella signing out for Blue Bear Flutes and BlueBearFlutes.com. I hope to see you again very soon. Y'all take care.